Go ahead. All right. We're continuing in our study in the book, The Acts of the Apostles. This week we come to the second chapter, a chapter that Christians are greatly familiar with because it's commonly taught. This may be one of the most common taught chapters in the Bible in modern Christianity. This is the chapter where Pentecost comes, and there's an entire movement called Pentecostals based on this uh, chapter. What I want to do today is I want to prayerfully and with you, and, and if you're not here and you're listening to this tape or Whatever, I, I would pray that what you would do is, is listen to this tape and open a Bible and put it in front of you. Open the Holy Scriptures, the King James Bible, and listen as we go through and follow every word. We're going to study the words. We're going to do a word study. We're not going to run through this chapter. We are going to walk through it one word at a time because God in the beginning was the, the Word. What a concept. Not the message, not the idea, not the notion, not the thought, the Word. And Jesus spoke words. And you, in the authorized version, you're going to read the words of Jesus Christ here. And so we're going to study this. Now, what we'll find in this particular chapter, this chapter will break down into two major sections. There will be verses 1 through 13 and verses 14 through, I think it's 47 is the last of verse. And in verses 1 through 13, we'll see the miracle. And in verses 14 through 47, we'll read the message that was preached on that particular day. And so, prayerfully now, Father in heaven, I pray you guide us as we read this passage. Let us begin in reading Acts chapter 2, reading verse 1 through 13, and then we'll comment. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, and Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. So, the first movement of this particular chapter is a miracle in verses 1 through 13. And now let us just slow down very carefully and let us go back to verse 1 and walk through this carefully and see what the Lord would like to reveal. Let us uh, study to show ourselves approved unto God as we go line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, the way the word of the Lord is written unto us. Verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, was fully come. The, the, the term that will be introduced in the New Testament, this is a New Testament term, is a term called Pentecost. This, this word is not found in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, if you read through there, you will find a word called the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks, uh, found in Exodus 34, Deuteronomy 16, 2 Chronicles chapter 8. In the New Testament, This Feast of Weeks is turned into what will be known as the Feast of Pentecost. We find it three times in the New Testament. Here in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 20, and in 1 Corinthians 16. Three times it will be mentioned in the New Testament. Now, turn to Leviticus 23. I want to show you when the priests were given the law of ceremony, how to worship God in truth in the Old Testament, 
This is what the Lord gave them in Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. In other words, the idea for this is not the Jews. The idea for this was not Moses. The idea for this was not Aaron and the high priests. This system, this ceremonial system, will be God-ordained, God-directed, God-planned, and they will be feasts unto the Lord. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord. This is the Lord's idea. Now, he's going to lay out the feasts in here. And when you move on down to verse 15, the first feast he's going to give to them is... Passover. And then he's going to say in verse 15, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheave of the wave offering. So that will be the Sunday after Passover. You count seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. And here he is describing unto them the Feast of Pentecost, not giving it that particular name, but he does say this in that sixteenth verse, ye shall number fifty days. Pente is a number that's a five number, like a a pentagon is a five-sided building. And Pentecost is going to be 50 days after the sheaf of the wave offering. So, so we have a New Testament term that is a fulfillment of an Old Testament feast that God is bringing forth here in the New Testament. So, so go back to where we were in Acts. I want you to understand what you're seeing now is the fulfillment now of what God had these people practicing in shadow and type in the Old Testament. The Old Testament was shadows and types pointing forward to the reality and the substance. And here we're having, go back to where you were, Acts chapter 2, and look at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Here it comes in its fullness. This is the feast of the Lord that He's bringing fulfillment of. It is fully coming on this particular day. That's what we're reading on. Now notice it's happening when the day was fully come. Do you remember how they would reckon time in the Jewish time calendar? It goes all the way back to Genesis 1. The evening and the morning, the first day. This is going to happen not during night. This is going to happen not during the evening. Twelve hours will pass. It's going to happen in the day of. Why is that? First Thessalonians chapter 5. Now let's just let... We're going to compare line on line and we're going to see God is doing something here decently and in order and in a particular manner. First Thessalonians chapter 5. When the day was fully come, the day of Pentecost. First Thessalonians 5, verse 5. Ye, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica, are all the children of light and the children of the day. The day is fully come. It is not evening, it is morning. Okay? It is the day of Pentecost fully come. Why? God is birthing something here. God is doing a work to the children of light. You are not in darkness. We are not of the night nor of darkness. This is going to be something, a miracle that's going to fully happen in view of many people. That's how God works miracles. Not off in a corner somewhere. This is a miracle that God's fully working in the day when it is fully come. Turn back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The day is fully come. It is something God is doing in the light. Why? Because this gospel, God will not have hid. This feast is going to have a, a meaning and a significance toward the gospel and toward the Son of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6. 
when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, for God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. This entire miracle is going to be used to bring forth light about Jesus Christ. That's what's going to happen on this particular day. We're going to study it carefully. I'm, I'm showing you ahead of time and we're going to walk through it verse by verse. This is the day of Pentecost. This is going to fulfill the type and it's going to happen during the day and it's going to bring forth light about Jesus Christ and it's the time fully come. Turn to the next book of Galatians, chapter 4. It's been a long time. It's been maybe 13, 1400 years these people have been practicing the Feast of Weeks. But now once, listen to me folks, once, God is once going to deliver the faith unto the saints. Not multiple times. How many crosses of Calvary were there? One. How many times did God appear on Mount Sinai to Moses? Once. How many times? God doesn't need to do things multiple times. The Feast of Pentecost is fully coming in its full fullness right here, Acts chapter 2. This is what we're reading about. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son. God is going to fulfill the types of the feasts one by one. He's already fulfilled the Passover about 50-something days before that when the Lamb of God that took it away the sin of the world hung on that cross. He fulfilled Passover. Now He's fulfilling Pentecost. He's not going to repeat Passover and He's not going to repeat Pentecost. Just trying to get you to think like God writes in his book. Okay? The fullness is coming right here. Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, where were, the, where were the disciples and the apostles? They were all with one accord in one place. Chapter 1, the Lord Jesus told them to wait. So they were in one accord. What's the accord? Well, 1 Corinthians 15, according to the Scriptures. They were doing everything scripturally. They were doing as it was written in the law of the Lord. They were obeying the word of the Lord. That's what God's children ought to do. Amen. That's what God's children ought to do, is obey the word of the Lord and hearken unto the law of the Lord and be in one accord according to the Scriptures. Then we can be of one mind. So they were there. They were waiting. They were being patient. What happened is they were waiting scripturally with the Scriptures, praying, reading Bible, Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, a, a sound from heaven suddenly as of a rushing mighty wind. I've heard testimonies of people who have seen tornadoes, gotten close to tornadoes and lived about it, been through hurricanes and lived about it, and they talk about this rushing, mighty wind sound. It's described many different ways. You've probably heard the testimonies yourself on news channels and the weather channel and discovery and things like that. That's what they're hearing, kind of like a whirlwind, something powerful, a tornado, a hurricane, something like this. Uh, according to uh, Job chapter 40, verse 6, the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind. They're hearing a rushing, mighty wind. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. I want to show you. I'll take you through Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a great prophet. Um, hard to be understood. A lot of time on your knees in prayer uh, asking the Lord about Ezekiel. Uh, for years, all I would read the book and I would say, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? Uh, often when I don't know what something someone's talking about, someone say, what are you, Ezekiel? Because I don't know what they're talking about. What are you talking about? Have you ever gotten that feeling reading this book? Am I the only one that gets confused reading Ezekiel? Okay. Well, well. Anyways, we read a lot, read a lot, and, and you start seeing. And, and Ezekiel is an interesting prophet. And uh, he, verse one, chapter one, verse one, came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, and the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. Verse three, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel. Verse four, and I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Uh, Psalm 75, that's where the Lord is. Uh, Isaiah 14, that's where the Lord is, in the north, way up high north. That, that way north, coming out of the north. And a whirlwind came out of the north. A great cloud, a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. Out of the midst thereof is the color of amber. Out of the midst of fire. Uh, 
Ezekiel is going to be given a vision, and in the first 11 chapters, God is coming to Ezekiel out of heaven, being carried by the cherubs in the form of a whirlwind coming down. And Ezekiel gets this vision, and God shows him the judgment to the church in the first, to the nation Israel. If the nation Israel was the church in the Old Testament, if you will, that's according to the preaching of Stephen in Acts chapter 7. But to the nation of Israel, showing the judgment that's coming there. And it's, it's a rushing, mighty wind uh, turned to um, Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel 3 and looking in verses uh, 12 and uh, 13. Then the Spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing that rushing mighty wind of the whirlwind he heard, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touch one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, a noise of a great rushing. There's that great rushing mighty wind that he's hearing in the whirlwind. So this, what's happening to the people at Pentecost is there, there's a movement of a rushing mighty wind like Ezekiel. It's coming from the north. It's God's Spirit coming down unto them. This this is what's happening. Ezekiel is giving you a picture of this thing right here. You know, what happened, unfortunately, for Ezekiel is if you continue to the 11th chapter and you see at verse 23, the sad thing in Ezekiel's vision is it was one of judgment. Verse 23, And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. You know what was happening? God gave him a picture of the fact that God was going to depart from the temple in Jerusalem. And what happened was the, 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 the vision came to Ezekiel and Ezekiel got to see as the, the glory lifted up from the temple, went out over the city, over mountain, and then disappeared. And all the temple was at that point was a shell without God's presence anymore because the nation had gone off into apostasy. And that's the last time you see that uh, rushing, mighty wind here in the Old Testament. But, but go back, I'm going to take you back historically to Second Chronicles chapter 5, hundreds of years before Ezekiel. And I'm lining this up. I want you to get Scripture on Scripture. Folks, my, my heart's desire is to teach you truth from the Word of God, not my opinions. I want you to see how Scripture is laid out. If, if we'll just take the time to read the words and compare them in the Old and the New Testament, this thing just explains itself. And then no one can lead you astray with some wind of doctrine about a rushing mighty wind. Second Chronicles chapter 5. Let me catch up to you. Second Chronicles chapter 5. The story is Solomon, David's son, is living in a peaceable kingdom. The wars are over. David had settled everything down and Solomon is working to build the house of the Lord and he has the craftsmen together and they're laboring carefully following the ordained plan verse uh, 1 2 uh, Chronicles 5 1 and uh, thus all the work that Solomon made for the house of the Lord was finished and Solomon brought in to the house of the Lord all the things that David his father hath dedicated and the silver and the gold and all the instruments put he among the treasures of the house of God. And then Solomon assembled all the elders of Israel. And so here they are. They, they did exactly what God said according to the word. They were all in one accord, in one place, early on in, in the nation's history. And they were walking in the law of the Lord. And they were doing what God had told them to do. And they, they assembled themselves together in the big feast, which was in the seventh month. It tells you verse 3. Wherefore all the men of Israel assembled themselves unto the king in the feast, which was in the seventh month. And this would be tabernacles. Verse 5, And they brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle. These did the priests and the Levites bring up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel that were assembled unto him before the ark sacrificed sheep and oxen which could not be told or numbered for multitude. And the priests brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, the most holy place, to the oracle of the house, into the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubims, for the cherubims spread forth their wings over the place of the ark, and the cherubims covered the ark and the staves thereof, and they drew out the staves of the ark, that the ends of the staves were seen from the ark before the oracle, but they were not seen without, and there it is unto this day. There was nothing 
in the ark, save the two tables which Moses put there in at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out from Egypt. And they were obeying that covenant. And they were doing what God told them to do. Verse 11, and here's what happened. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place for all the priests that were present were sanctified and, and did not wait then by course. So they were doing what they were told to do. Verse 12, also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood at the east end of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Isn't that curious? There was 120 disciples assembled in the upper room. Acts chapter 2. Here's 120 priests. They're doing exactly what God told them to do in the Old Testament. Verse 13, And it came even to pass, as the trumpets and the singers were as one, there they are, one accord, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. The great rushing mighty wind came down out of the north. God said, I am pleased. Well done, thou good and faithful servants of one accord. And he brought down his glory and entered into the most holy place and hovered above the ark at the mercy seat. And God stayed right there. And the glory cloud was so great that the priests couldn't stand to minister. They had to turn away from that powerful glory cloud and it filled the temple. That's Old Testament. That's Old Testament. I want to show you historically. Now, go back to New Testament. Acts chapter 2. This is why I have labored with you to teach you dispensational truth so we could rightly divide the Word of God and understand the difference between what the Lord did with the first covenant with a physical people in a physical land and a physical temple and what the Lord's now doing in the new covenant in the blood of His Son to a spiritual household, spiritually, who are born of the Spirit. And there's something different. And God's making a transition here. Acts is a transitional book. Things are going to change from the old covenant to the new here. And watch what happens. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, it filled all the house where they were sitting. Now, they were, you know where they were? They were in the upper room, the same place the Last Supper was held. And this, this, this whirlwind comes from out of heaven. And it comes down and it's aimed at Jerusalem. And right down the street from where they're sitting is the temple. Zerubbabel's temple that had been refurbished by uh, Herod. The very temple where the priests were doing all the work. The very temple where a number of weeks back they had conducted their Passover ceremony. The very temple where all these people are gathered together, verse 5, to come for the Feast of Weeks to go to that particular temple where the high priests Annas and Caiaphas are to do all the work. And that cloud doesn't come to that temple. It comes to the house where these men are sitting, to the upper room where the Last Supper was, where he said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And drink. This is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for you. And it comes to that particular house. So the thought, right away, it's, it, God is doing things different. Let me show you when he did this again. Go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. God did this before. It's a new covenant. And it's not Mosaic. It's about Jesus. There's a new mediator. It's not a human made mediator, Moses. It's the, the God-man, Christ Jesus. And as the Lord begins the unfolding of this covenant, He's working in ways that are contrary, at least to the mind of the Jewish people. Because they were thinking literally, they were thinking physically, they were thinking the letter of the law, and they weren't allowing God to give them spiritual interpretation. The letter of the law killeth. The Spirit giveth life. My wife and I were talking about that this morning. She's asking me questions about, well, do you really think Satan actually thought that? And I said, you want to problem with Satan? The problem with Satan is he doesn't know Bible. 
He knows Bible literally. He's got a photographic memory, but he doesn't know it spiritually, and he has no understanding of the book. And he's in utter confusion because sin confuses your ability to understand this book. And this book is only revealed by the Spirit of God, and there's no communion between Satan and the Spirit of God. What concord hath the Spirit of Christ with Belial? None whatsoever. So he's got a photographic memory, and a Christian may be impressed that some satanic guy can quote uh, Bible verses. I don't hang out with satanic guys. Well, have you ever like had two guys visit you one Saturday afternoon at your house and talk to you about, uh, about their religion? And you, you walk away going, man, they know a lot of Bible. Oh, yeah, photographically like Satan, but they have no understanding of it. It's the Spirit that giveth life. You can quote Bible left and right. and you may, you, That's like taking pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, putting them upside down and backwards. They don't fit. And here God's doing something spiritually. Luke chapter 1, the same thing was happening. In Luke chapter 1, there's a priest named Zacharias in the temple. And, and the angel visits him in the temple, not the Spirit of the Lord. And then later on, in this same chapter, Luke chapter 1, verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. And he's going to talk about a movement of the Holy Ghost, verse 35. The angel answered and said, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. And that movement of God's Spirit isn't going to happen in Jerusalem. It's going to happen right here in Nazareth, Mary. And God says, I'm moving differently. Pay attention to me when I move. Be sensitive to the leading of my Spirit. And God did something completely different here as He moved His Spirit up to Nazareth. Now here God's doing something different in Acts chapter 2. He's taking His Spirit, instead of sending it to the temple, He's sending it to the upper room. Now go back to where we were. I want to show you. There's a movement happening here. A change. This spirit is moving not to the temple, but to the upper room. Now this might even be acceptable to the Jews, but we're going to go a step beyond that in a few moments and watch what happens. Verse 3. Okay, so verse 2. There suddenly came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So there they are, the 120 of them. They're in the upper room. Here comes the Spirit. It fills this house. It doesn't fill the one down the street, which is the temple of the Lord. It doesn't go to the most holy place. You know what happened in the most holy place about 50-something days earlier? The veil was ripped. That had to be pretty scary for the high priest. You know why that was scary? Do you remember what happened to anyone if they went behind that veil? Only one person was allowed to go behind that veil once a year, the high priest. And he had to go with a blood sacrifice. And he had to go with a clean heart and clean hands. Or you know what happened to him? God would kill him. That's why he wore bells. So the people on the other side of the veil could hear that he was still alive as the bells were ringing. If the bell stopped, God killed him. And then they had to pull him out with a hook. Nobody could look upon the glory of God because it would kill them. And I can imagine after Christ hung on that cross and, and they came back to the... Uh, that, that, criminal and they came back to the holy place and the veil was ripped in two and there is the ark right before their eyes and they're thinking I'm going to die I'm going to die and they didn't die why the glory of God was gone it was a dead religion that was all that was left and here comes the glory of God 50 something days later and it doesn't go back to the ark it now goes into the upper room and it goes a step further than this watch verse 3 and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now, there appeared cloven tongues. The word cloven is the past participle of the word cleave. Now, the word cleave is a most interesting word. It's an antonymic word. Are you aware of that? It means two opposites simultaneously. Get a dictionary and look up the word cleave. It means complete opposites. And, and it means, number one, to split with a sharp instrument, like, like to circumcise something, to cut something, cleave it apart, a meat cleaver. It means to divide or to separate. But it also means to adhere, to cling fast, to stick to. And you shall cleave unto your wife, to stick together, to be faithful, to cleave unto your principles. Um... Turn to uh, the turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter five.
Jeremiah chapter 5. So there appeared cloven tongues like as of fire. Jeremiah chapter 5. This, this kind of tongue that, that's a circumcised, separated tongue, and yet it's adherent manner to something. It's separated from one thing and adherent to something else. It's separated from the spirit of the world and it's adherent and stuck fast and cloven to the spirit of God and truth. It's, it's divided the spirit of error from the spirit of truth. It's, it's cleaved light from darkness and it has no part with darkness. And it's like as a fire, Jeremiah 5, verse 14. Wherefore thus saith the Lord... Don't you like that saying? Isn't that great saying, thus saith the Lord? Wherefore thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire. These cloven tongues are going to be adherent to the Word of God. They're going to be likened to the words of God. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. These cloven tongues like as of fire. Jeremiah chapter 20. My word will be like fire. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse um, 9. Jeremiah was a little depressed here. He had been preaching, and every time he preached, people tell him, go away. And every time he preached, people tell him, I don't want to hear that anymore. I don't believe that. Every time he preached, people would say, what's the matter with you? Are you in some kind of a cult? How can you say things like that? And so finally, then, people got so mad, they beat him up and threw him in a pit. And verse 9, and... Uh, then, then said I, Jeremiah was upset. <laughs> Jeremiah 20, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. He's, he's, it was rough. You ever get to feel like that sometimes? You ever go out there and I mean, you try your level-headed best to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ and the truth that he has and the fact that he will love them and in grace offer them salvation and a place in heaven and, 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 and they don't want to hear it and they don't want to hear it and sometimes they think, I'm just not going to talk about it anymore. I had a guy come to me at the hospital one day. He grabbed me, pulled me into a closet. <laughs> he pulled me into a closet. What are we doing in a closet here? Two men. I mean, we get the wrong idea. What's going on here? And he says, they're after us. Who's after us? The administration. See, he was a guy that I had led to the Lord. And, and I was always passing out tracts and Bibles at the hospital. And he started following in my footsteps. Well, the administrators got to him first. And they said, you know, we're going to yank your privileges and throw you from the hospital. He says, I can't take this anymore. I got a family. I got, I got, I got, I got, I'm not talking about him anymore. That's it. I'm done. I'm just going to be a doctor at the hospital. I understand the fear. Like Jeremiah has had enough. I understand. Jeremiah said, I'm not going to talk anymore about his name. But watch what happened in the middle of the verse. <laughs> but his word was in my heart as a burning fire. Shot up in my bones. I, I was weary with forbearing. I could not stay. And he goes out and preaches again. He just couldn't keep it in him. He had to speak. Cloven tongues like as of fire. The word of the Lord like fire burning in you. Turn to Psalm uh, 39. Psalm 39. David had interacted with a number of people in his life and this is a psalm that he wrote in Psalm 39, verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I guess one of the problems that happened is sometimes when he was with the wicked people, he would find himself slipping into their way of speaking. Maybe a little slang, maybe an occasional off-color word. And he's thinking, you know, I, I just if I don't talk with them, if I don't associate, that's the best thing. I'll keep my mouth with a bridle. Verse 2, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace, even from good. I mean, they were talking and they were going on and I kept thinking, you know, I'd like to say this, but I better not. I'd like to say this, but I better not. I, and he's trying to hold. And my sorrow was stirred. Verse 3, my heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. You know, guys, that's uh, Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the only way. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No man's education is complete without a knowledge of the Bible. You know, David started saying things like that. 
because the, it was burning. Fire burned. Cloven tongues like as a fire. It's a figurative language that God's using to speak of His Word. Now notice, go back. It said like as. Stay, okay, stay in Psalms. I'll show you. It said like as of fire. That's if you have the authorized version of the Scriptures. I mean, he puts two metaphorical words. He could have said like fire. He could have said as fire. But he didn't want you to miss it. So verily, very like as of fire. It is not God's fire. It is a figurative language of the burning presence of His Word. But it's not God's fire. How do I know that? Well, go to Psalm 21. I'll take you a few places. And then I'll let Jesus confirm it for you. Psalm 21. What I'm saying to you, what is it we're going to read? It is not, this is not the baptism of fire in the upper room. This is not the baptism of fire. I'll show you from the Scriptures. Psalm 21. Psalm 21, picking it up in verse 8 and 9. The psalmist speaking to the Lord. Verse 7, the king trusteth in the Lord. Verse 8, thine hand, Lord's hand, shall find out all thine enemies. It's not my job to find out the enemies. Thy right hand shall find out those that hate thee. That's the right hand of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath and the fire shall devour them. These cloven tongues are like as a fire, but they are not God's fire. Our God is a consuming fire. When the fire came down in the Old Testament to the temple, the priests had to leave the building. It would have burned them up. They could not stand because of that glory. This is a different move that God's working here. This is not a baptism of fire. It would have killed the men. God's fire consumes. Folks, you and I need asbestos bodies to stand in the presence of the Lord. And you're going to get one, 1 Corinthians 15, when we shall all be changed. Then we'll be able to get near God's fire. But God's fire, if it got within 50 yards of any one of us, would kill us now, even as small as a tongue. So this is a a like as a fire, but it's not a baptism of fire. Go to uh, Psalm 50. And then I'll take you to the words of Jesus, and he'll confirm it. Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Uh... I just love it, the Psalm of Asaph. I want verse 3, but verse 1 is so good. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken. Amen. I love that. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Verse 3, our God shall come and shall not keep silence. You know, he's coming back. Revelation 1, verse 7. A fire shall devour before him. It shall be very tempestuous round about him. When When Jesus comes back in his full glory as the consuming power and the mighty clouds of glory of God, with the glory he had with God before the foundation of the world, we're just not ready for it. It'd like be bringing a piece of the sun down, which is much weaker and less bright than Jesus, and bringing that down to earth. Five million degrees. It'll burn things up. So the fire that God's going to bring someday, the baptism of fire is going to be a devouring fire of destruction. This is not a baptism of fire. Turn to Matthew chapter 3. And it's a shame I even have to teach this way. And I only have to teach this way because every other, so many other people are out there teaching the wrong way to you. And trying to make this, this chapter say whatever they want it to say. I'm telling you this is a baptism of fire. I've known people that pray for the baptism of fire. And I think, are you nuts? (laughs) You want to be baptized with fire? Do you understand what that means? We'll show you. Let's look at the scriptures. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist is preaching and people are coming out to him. And uh, John says in verse 11, look. He says, I indeed uh, baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, comma, and with fire. That comma separates the first and second coming. The first coming is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The second coming is the baptism of fire. How do I know? Next verse. 
whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, continuing on the second coming, and gather his wheat into the garner. He says as much in Matthew 24, 25, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. The wheat will get the Holy Ghost, and the chaff will get the fire. That's the baptism of fire. Now, watch Jesus, Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. The Lord Jesus, Acts chapter 1, words of red. Verse 4, words of red. Jesus says, But wait for the promise of the Father, which, he saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. He doesn't say anything about them being baptized with fire, because those are his own children. Those are his wheat. They're not chaff. He's not going to baptize them with fire. He omits the little um, a positive and fire because they're not meant to be baptized with fire. None of you who have received Jesus Christ are meant to be baptized with fire. So he omits it here. Verse 8, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Again, he omits the phrase and fire. So, the baptism of fire is the baptism of Revelation chapter 20, verses 9 through 15. That's when the wicked are cast into a lake of fire. They will be immersed in fire and devoured. That's when the chaff get burned up once and for all. So, again, going back to where we were in Acts chapter 2, there appeared cloven tongues like as a fire but not God's consuming fire. This is not a baptism of fire that these people are going through. They're getting a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And this is what happens to them. Verse 3, it says, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now, 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 something's happening here a little bit different. In the Old Testament, when the glory came down, it sat upon the mercy seat. And it resided in a house. Now, all of a sudden, it's coming to a house. And you might think, okay, God's going to change headquarters from the temple to the upper room. After all, the upper room is a very sacred place. And we should have tours and go to the upper room and show people around. And this is the upper room. And there's the table over there. And and that relic might be a chalice. And there's probably a splinter of wood from the table. And this may be the very bench that Jesus sat on. and, and, And a very sacred place. But God's not going to work with places in the New Testament. And there aren't going to be relics in the New Testament. And instead of staying in the upper room, all of a sudden these tongues start landing upon the disciples. It's getting very personal in the New Testament. Instead of place-like and positional. God's doing something new here. And the tongues are starting to split up and and land on the people there in the upper room. It comes upon them. It sat upon them. Now, Jesus said in verse 8 that the Holy Ghost would come upon you. And you, this even happened in, in small instances in the Old Testament. Not like rushing mighty winds and not like cloven tongues of fire, but go back to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, we're reading about uh, the time of the judges up and down and up and down. (laughs) And uh, a man by the name of Othniel is going to be called by the Lord to deliver the people. He's Caleb's, uh, the son of Caleb's younger brother. And so this man Othniel is going to be, verse 9, And when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer to the children of Israel who delivered them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. Verse 10, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him came upon him. Now here's the Spirit of the Lord in the form of these cloven tongues landing upon these people and it's almost similar to an an Old Testament phenomenon. We see this again happen in Judges uh, chapter uh, 14. You'll see this again in Judges 14. It doesn't come in the form of cloven tongues but the concept of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone, even an Old Testament thing. Judges 14 uh, 
verse 1, talking about Samson, and uh, Samson went down to Timnath. Verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. There's a young lion was after him, and he rent the lion as he would a kid. And so the, the concept of the Holy Spirit coming upon people every so often was an Old Testament phenomenon that would occur from time to time. But now there's going to be a shift, a change in the New Testament that you'll find in verse 4. If you go back to where we were, verse 4 is going to mention the change, and this is significant. At the end of verse 3, okay, these cloven tongues like as a fire, it sat upon each of them, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Now we're not talking about the Spirit of God coming upon people anymore. We're talking about the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, entering in to a human vessel and filling that vessel. This is brand new, folks. This is a new phenomenon. This is what God intended. And this is what God has desired, is a communion like this with people. And our sin has caused God to separate His Spirit from our spirit. And we have been separated because of our sin and iniquity. And now because of the propitiation cross work of Jesus Christ and the possibility of the new birth, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost can enter into a human vessel. And that's what's taking place right here at Pentecost. It's not just coming to a room. There's not going to be some new sacred relic that people are going to visit at $3,000 a pop to make a pilgrimage to. This Holy Ghost is going to move right in and reside inside of people. Now, this is something that Jesus Christ mentioned. Go back to John 14. I tell you, every word of this Bible is pure. I have these words circled in my Bible. I'll show you in John 14. John chapter 14. Amen. He tells in verse 17, he's, they're in the upper room. Their hearts are very troubled. They're finally beginning to get the concept that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to die the next day. And their hearts are troubled by that. And he begins in this beautiful passage in chapter 14, 15, 16, 17 to give them new truths about something new that God is going to do, one of which is they're going to go to heaven, something an Old Testament Jew never looked forward to. The hope of the Old Testament Jew was resurrection in a physical body to live in the millennial kingdom. That was his desire. And they'll get that. But the hope of the born-again Christian is the blessed hope of the new body and a place in the New Jerusalem, in heaven, to dwell with God. And this is something new he's given them. And then he tells them this in 17th verse. He says, And even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth, you can circle it, with you, and shall be, you can circle it, in you. And there's the difference in those two verses between the Old Testament reality and the New Testament reality. The most the Holy Ghost could ever do in the Old Testament was if someone was walking according to the righteousness of the law, in the ordinances of the law, the Holy Ghost could kind of dwell with him. Come upon him. Be nigh unto him. But it could not reside inside of him. And he said, you find young Jewish men who have been following me for these three years and, and hearkening to my teaching of the Scriptures, and now... As he said in the 16th verse, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father. If, if you believe, you know, believe in me. Believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me. You believe in God, believe also in me, he tells them in that chapter. And he's saying because of that, very soon when I send the Spirit of truth back, he won't just be with you, he'll be in you. He will be in you. This is the New Testament reality that's taking place. Right here. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We're going to wind up with a few verses and then we'll go next week. Romans chapter 8. We'll go in order here. Romans and then 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Romans 8. Roman, Paul has preached the gospel of Jesus Christ explained that it is by God's grace through your faith in Christ's work. And then he says this in Romans 8. And in verse 11, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, there it is, dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. 
This is what's happening at Pentecost. God is sending His Spirit into individual vessels. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. Next book, 1 Corinthians 3. God is moving not in the temple of Jerusalem. He's not even moving in the upper room. He's not moving at the crucifix. He's not moving at the tomb where Jesus died. He's moving His temple, 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not, ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. It's a New Testament reality. It's the new birth, being born of the Spirit, having the Holy Ghost residing in you. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 6.19. Paul is, and, that, and he asks, asks these questions of the Corinthians. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? you are you still thinking Old Testament like now? I understand it was hard for them. I mean, we're living 2,000 years later. I think we've heard it. But back then, that was amazing. God's Spirit is living inside of people. We're the temple? Yes, you're the temple. You're the temple. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? What do you think? God's moving His Spirit into the upper room now? That's idolatry. Ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's what's happening here. What's happening here now, we're just beginning to un. Ravel this one word at a time. We've only got to verse 4. We're going to go on next week. But I want to settle this in your minds, in your hearts, in your spirit. God is unfolding a New Testament work and He's opening something up that the Spirit of the living God, the Spirit that raised up Jesus Christ, that Spirit is willing to dwell in any person that will place his faith in God's Son. That will, that will confess with his mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in his heart that God hath raised him from the dead and he is the propitiation for your sins. Plus nothing and minus nothing. And God is beginning a new work and he's doing it in a miraculous way on one particular day. And we'll continue next week. Now, there were any questions so far as we're just walking along, somebody somewhere, something? Yes, brother. Yeah, um, I was wondering about um, John the Baptist. Yes. It says that he will be filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. Yes. And I'll tell you, the, the filling, and I'm, I'm going to have to show you that we're going to do the temple diagram. He was only allowed to fill, if you will, during his breathing and speaking aspect. He was not allowed to fill in his soul. And we're going to show you that from the Scriptures. The temple gives a perfect picture in the tabernacle that the soul is what's being filled with the Holy Ghost. Even when the, and you'll see a few passages in the Old Testament where it says, while, while I speak, the Spirit of God is in me. Some of the prophets will say that. And he's filling in the lung cavity and he's speaking out like that, but he's not allowed to fill the soul of that individual. And so it's a kind of like a bodily possession in and out, bodily possession in and out. That's how he will come upon, come in and out, but not the soul. And we'll make that fine distinction. And that's why the Spirit of God could depart from people. And we're going to see here with this Pentecost work, the Holy Spirit's going to come in and it's going to dwell with you forever. And will not leave you and will not forsake you. And it's a New Testament movement that's being birthed right here. And so, so I'll show you that the temple, the pictures of the tabernacle, we're almost there in a few weeks. I'm going to draw the diagram right on the board and you can just see it plain as day. And the, and the Lord lays it right out on the tabernacle foundation. The difference between the body, the soul, and the spirit and where the spirit of God goes. And it's a picture of what, what he does in the New Testament. The circumcision of God, the operation of God without hands. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to you know, kind of carefully walk through this one word at a time. Thank you that you have so much line upon line, precept upon precept, scripture upon scripture, Lord, that you can speak for us, that this is not your consuming fire. These are like as of fire, the fire that burns in our bones of the word of God. And thank you, that's what the Holy Spirit wants to bring is the Word of God to us. Help us, Lord, to be filled with your Word, filled with your Spirit, and then help us while the fire muses inside of us that we will open our mouth and speak and warn the wicked to turn from their wicked ways. Why will they die? Help them to turn to the truth and the life, the resurrection and the life, your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen.